Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm very touched by that wonderful introduction. I am delighted to be here. I think it's um, fantastic that I get a chance to share our science, even though I can't come there personally tonight. And so I'm very glad that this event could happen. And then I guess I would just say that the last time I was in Kansas City, which was a couple years ago, I got to spend one of the most magical days of my life at the Linda Hall Library, seeing and books and manuscripts and pieces that I had heard about in my entire life, but never imagined that I could see for real. And I'll just never forget that day. And so the second I got asked to give this talk, I immediately said yes. And so I feel very close to the library, even if I'm far away tonight, um, my heart is there and I'm imagining myself being there while I give this talk. And so just one more time, a heartfelt thanks for inviting me and letting me get to share some science with you tonight. So I only have one, I'll just get into it. I only have uh, one goal for this lecture, and that's to try to convince you that bacteria can talk to each other. And if I manage that overarching goal, my sort of secondary goal is to try to convince you that the bacteria are multilingual. And then the third thing I'd like you to come away with is to understand that learning about these languages that bacteria have, that perhaps that's practical and you already got an introduction to this, because maybe if we learn enough about them, we can thwart these bacteria from communicating in efforts to make new kinds of urgently needed therapeutics. So that's where we're going. And let me just start. Um, Okay, let me just start by making sure that we're all on the same page about uh, bacteria because these are the critters that I'll be talking about for the um, entire seminar. So bacteria are the world's oldest organisms. They've been on the earth for almost 4 billion years um, and they all look pretty much like the cartoon of this bacterium that I'm showing you here, which would be like an E. coli that would live in your gut. And so they are single celled organisms they are too small to see with your eyes. You have to, to see them. One has to look in a microscope, but they all look pretty much like this. And what I mean by that is that, as I said, they're one cell, but they're surrounded by a membrane. And you can think of the membrane as their skin that keeps the outside world out and the inside world in. And inside the bacteria is the cytoplasm. So that's just this gooey stuff that um, this liquid that's inside the bacteria with all their biomolecules roiling around in there. And then bacteria all have one chromosome. So they have one piece of DNA that has their genetic blueprint. And so they have a couple thousand genes, right? So they're pretty simple looking. They're pretty simple. They're constituents, right? And if you actually watch them under a microscope, they also look pretty simple. What one would see is that bacteria consume nutrients from their environment. They grow to twice their size. They double all those components. They cut themselves down the middle and one cell becomes two, becomes four, and so on. And so they seem to live these sort of um, boring, mundane lives where they eat and divide. And so we've known about bacteria for, or scientists have, for about 500 years. And for 480 of those years, they've always been thought to be really simple and primitive. They eat and divide. And when they divide, each sister cell has no knowledge, if you will, of its sibling. They each just go out and live their own life with no interactions with their neighbors. And I'm going to try to convince you that that's not true, that in fact, they haven't they have profound interactions and they can actually communicate and carry out group behaviors. But before I get into that, I wanna make sure that you know something about your relationship with bacteria because of course they're invisible to the naked eye. So very often they get taken for granted. But let me just try to give you <laughs> the, my view of the world and the place of bacteria in it. Okay, so on this slide, I've made a little cartoon that's supposed to represent a human being. And I've done a little uh, mathematical metric here with all these little circles. Those are supposed to represent the cells, the human cells that make up your body. And we know how many cells there are. There's some trillions of cells. So that's how many human cells it takes to give us, to make, give us our physical form and make a human being. At any time in your life, you have a hundred times, uh, excuse me, 10 times more bacterial cells than human cells in you or on you, right? So if you use this math, you're 10% human, 90% bacterial. Okay, but of course we now know it's not all about the cells, it's about the DNA, which is the famous double helix that uh, has our genes and the information that 
take it takes to make a living being. And so you probably know we have the sequence of the human genome. So I've made my man again out of the A's, T's, G's, and C's that are the components of the human genome. And we know how many genes there are in human beings. There's about 25,000 or so genes. So that's how many genes it takes to give you your physical form and then all of your characteristics, all of your attributes. That's how much information you need. So it turns out at any time in your life, you have a hundred times more bacterial genes in you or on you than human genes. So you can use whichever of these metrics you like. In my view, at best, you're 10% human. Really, you're only 1% human because the other 99%, those genes come from bacteria. And these bacteria are not just passive riders. We know they are vital for making life possible because all of these bacteria with these genes give us bioproducts that our own genomes don't encode. So these bacteria are our 24 seven partners and they are giving us um, products that we need for life to be possible, um, but that we don't have the capacity ourselves to make. And so um, what we now know is that there would be no life on earth if it weren't for the bacteria. So I don't wanna be a Pollyanna here. You've obviously heard of bacteria and most of the time when you hear about bacteria they get bad press and that's because they cause disease and so bacteria we now understand or scientists now understand have sort of these two different lifestyles so these are just pictures of bacteria taken under a microscope different famous bacteria and there are all kinds of bacteria like in this top row that live in the environment that have no business being in or on a human or a plant or an animal. And if they do get a toehold on us, they can make us sick or they can kill us. But now, of course, what we're increasingly recognizing and what I just told you on my last slides is that there's all these magical bacteria that live in consortia with every higher organism and they give these organisms capabilities that make that are essential for life and that make us healthy. And so these bacteria are now called the microbiome. And so they do all kinds of amazing feats when they're making us healthy. For example, they help in digesting food. Just as one example, whenever you eat plant food, so if you eat a salad or you eat vegetables, you do not have the enzymes to break up those um, vegetables and get the nutrients. The bacteria in your gut do that for you and they give you the calories and they give you the nutrients. We also now know that early in life, the bacteria that are living as our microbiome, they um, educate our immune system and so somehow they tell your immune system how to keep bad bacteria out or harmful bacteria out but beneficial bacteria in. We also know that these microbiome bacteria provide us all kinds of micronutrients that make our enzymes and bioproducts work. And so this list goes on and on. We're only now understanding um, many of the properties that these bacteria give us. But the point that I want to make from this slide, this sort of overarching point, is that bacteria can be harmful or they can be beneficial. Those are facts now. What my lab is always trying to understand is whether you're thinking about the bad bacteria or you're thinking about the good bacteria, how can they do any of these things? They're so small. As I told you, you, know, you need a microscope to see one. So how can it be that these itty bitty critters have the power to either make us sick or kill us, or on the other hand, keep us alive. And so that's what my lab wants to find out is how do bacteria manage to do these feats. And so I'm going to tell you what we've been learning about that as we go along during this seminar. And what I thought I would do is to just give you a, a historical um, sort of tour of how we got to this idea that the way bacteria do these feats is they communicate, they count their numbers, they recognize when they have the right number, if all the bacteria do something together, they can accomplish feats like these that they could never accomplish as an individual. And I'm going to show how we got there because it came from a quirky observation um, from the ocean led to this whole field and this idea of bacterial group behavior and communication. So it all started with this animal. So what you're looking at, this is the Hawaiian bobtail squid. It lives in the ocean and it's about an inch big and it lives just off the coast of Hawaii. And this animal is nocturnal. So what it does is it sleeps during the day and at night it comes out to hunt. 
And so what we've done is we've put this animal or this animal has been put into an aquarium. And so I'm going to play this little movie for you. And so the lights are on. And so what you can see is this squid is really nervous. It looks kind of spastic because it's never meant to be out in the light. If it was out, this would be like the daylight, it would get eaten by a predator. So it seems very nervous under those conditions. So now same squid. And what we've done is to give it some sediment. Okay, and now the light is on, and so the squid thinks it's day, and so the squid is going to go to sleep. And so what you see is that the squid buries itself in the sand. It just camouflaged itself, but then it buries itself in the sand to escape from predators. It's thorough. So what happens is that if a squid gets eaten by a predator, that happens once. And so she's very careful to completely cover herself and get a few millimeters under this sediment. And then she will retract her tentacles. And if I showed you this picture, you wouldn't know that there is a squid in this aquarium. In fact, there's about 10 of them in there. So that is a fantastic strategy that that squid has to escape from its predators during the day. Good strategy. The problem for this squid is it can't stay there all the time. At night, it has to come out to hunt. And so when it comes out at night, it's vulnerable to predators. And so this squid just lives in shallow, sort of knee-deep water. And the problem for the squid is, is when it comes out to hunt, since it's in such shallow water, on bright nights when there's lots of starlight or moonlight, that light can penetrate the depth of the, the water that the squid lives in. So if it was swimming around, it would cast a shadow and predators would see that shadow, calculate its trajectory, and eat it. And so the squid needs a solution to be invisible at night. And this is where the bacteria come in. So now you're looking at a, one of these squid. It's been turned on its back. And I hope what you can see are these glowing orbs, these lobes that are under the body or the mantle of the squid. Inside that, that specialized light organ is a bacterium named Vibrio fischeri. So it's in here, packed in there at like 10 to the 12th bacteria per milliliter. It's like toothpaste of bacteria. And so these bacteria are in this light organ of the squid. And what's special about Vibrio fischeri is it makes bioluminescence. So it makes light like firefly light, except the light is blue. And so the way that this symbiosis works is when the squid emerges at night to hunt, it has detectors on its back. So it can sense how much starlight or moonlight is hitting its back. And then it opens and closes a shutter. It's just its ink sac under this light organ that houses the bacteria. And so it modulates how much light comes out of the bottom, which are made by the bacteria. And so the squid matches the amount of light hitting its back with the amount of light coming out of the bottom, the bioluminescence made by the bacteria, so it doesn't make a shadow. So it actually uses the light that Vibrio fischeride makes to counter illuminate itself in this anti-predation device. So now the squid's got it made. It's got a way to stay invisible during the day. It's buried in the sediment. At night, it counter illuminates itself to, to hide its shadow using light that these bacteria provide it, right? And that allows it both parts of the day and night to escape from predators. So that's how the symbiosis works. But now I want to switch to the talking about this from the bacterial point of view. So it turns out that the bacteria only make light when they're at high cell density, which is only at night inside that squid organ. So now let's change to the bacterium, that the bacterial side of this interaction. So this cartoon, this is supposed to be my Vibrio fischeri cell. So when the cells are at low cell density, so if there's only a few cells around, the bacteria don't make light. And that makes sense. They can't individually make enough light to be perceivable. But what the bacteria do is that they make and release small molecules that I have depicted as these red triangles that you can think of like hormones or pheromones. And we call these molecules autoinducers. So the world is big, bacteria are small. When these bacteria are at low density and they make the autoinducers, the autoinducers diffuse away into the environment. The bacteria can't detect them. And that says you're alone, don't make light. But as the bacteria grow and divide, since all of the cells are making a share of these extracellular autoinducer compounds, the amount of the autoinducers of these hormone-like molecules that surrounds the cells increases in proportion to cell number. So the more bacteria there are, the more of these molecules there are. And so inside the squid light organ, these molecules can accumulate as the bacteria are growing. When the molecules hit a particular amount, 
the bacteria detect it and they infer from that detection event that they much, must have neighbors around. And so in unison, all of the bacteria make light together and that squid is using that light for that counter illumination property. So in fact, the bacteria have no idea how many other cells there are. They use the concentration of this chemical, the autoinducer, as a proxy for cell number. And they believe, if you will, if they detect that chemical, there must be neighboring bacteria around. And we know we're right about this because we can spin these cells out of the culture for, with a, in a centrifuge and collect up the liquids that have the molecules. And if we squirt those on dilute cells, they will turn on light. So in fact, they don't know there's other cells around. They're using this chemical word to tell them that other cells are there and that's how they know to make light. And so what the squid does is at night, it's like this and the bacteria are making light. Every morning when the sun comes up, the squid squirts out like 95% of these bacteria. That's with a pump that's attached to its circadian rhythm. So the bacteria become in this scenario, so they don't make light during the day. As the day goes by, they grow and divide, and they're not making light. The squid doesn't care. It's asleep in the sand. At night, they hit this perfect amount. The autoinducer's there. They turn on light. The squid uses it, and this cycle repeats and repeats night and day, night and day, and the squid modulates that with the pump, and the light comes on exactly when the squid needs it, and it's useful as this anti-predation device. Okay, so that's how it works both from the squid angle and from the bacterial angle. And we and other scientists were really interested in this idea of these bacteria carrying out this group behavior because these are these ancient, you know, billion year old organisms. And so we wanted to try to understand how does this work. And so what we did was to find the chemicals and the molecules that are involved in this process in the bacteria. So now you're looking at another cartoon. This again is supposed to be my Vibrio fisheri cell. And what we found was that there was a gene and a protein, an enzyme, that makes that autoinducer the hormone-like molecule. And then as the cells grow and divide, that autoinducer gets released into the environment. It accumulates with cell number, as I told you. And then we found that there is a partner protein, a receptor that sits on the bacterial membrane and connects the outside world of the bacteria to the inside world of the bacteria. And so this protein, the, the receptor, has a slot that the autoinducer molecule can fit into. And so when the autoinducer concentration hits a high amount, right, this autoinducer will slot into this receptor like a lock and a key, and that will send information inside the cell to tell Vibrio fisheri to turn on the genes that make the enzymes that make light. And so it's really simple the way this works. The more bacteria there are, there are, the more of this molecule there is, at a particular threshold amount of that molecule, it will interact with a receptor protein that sends a signal into the cells and all the cells in unison turn on light. And so that is how they carry out this collective behavior and make light that becomes perceivable. They do it together. And so why this is interesting is that after these discoveries were made, what became clear is that this was not restricted. It's not some crazy anomaly of this bacterium in the ocean. Other scientists started to think about couldn't bacteria have you know, collected behaviors. And at last count, there have been thousands and thousands of bacteria that have been shown to have these kinds of circuits. So all of these bacteria have an enzyme that makes an autoinducer molecule. There's always a partner receptor that detects that autoinducer. And together, these complexes turn on all kinds of group behaviors when bacteria are in communities, but not when they're alone. And so now we have a fancy name for this. We call this quorum sensing. The bacteria vote with these chemical votes. The vote gets counted. And in this sort of democratic decision-making processes, process, the bacteria turn on these group behaviors. And it's not all about light. What's become clear in our field is that the kinds of behaviors that are controlled by quorum sensing across the bacterial domain are ones that you have to have lots of bacteria acting together to make the behavior effective. So we have dozens and dozens of examples of clinically relevant bacteria that all turn on 
virulence together. And so you can imagine this, right? When a couple bacteria get in, you know, a harmful bacteria get into, say, a human, they can't, they don't have enough wherewithal to make the human sick. So what they do is they wait. They, and they, they multiply and they recognize using these autoinducers when they have the right cell number that if all of them launch their attack together like an army, they can overcome the human immune system. So we have all kinds of examples of bacteria that can't make biofilms, which is the first step in an infection, which is how bacteria sit on surfaces like your intestine, your lungs, and then the group-wide production of virulence factors, the toxins, the poisons, the things that get released that allow bacteria to get a toehold and make the human sick. And so what we know is that if we make bacteria that can't talk or can't hear because they don't have quorum sensing, they're completely avirulent. Right, so quorum sensing is fundamental to disease and, and all kinds of processes where the bacteria are going to put something out there, you know, a public good, and they need lots of bacteria working together so I get the benefit of your work and you get the benefit of my work, and then collectively the process succeeds. So that is quorum sensing, and we think that this is widespread in the bacterial world. It is how bacteria get a bang for their buck. They do it as groups. Okay, so that's quorum sensing, right? It's in terrestrial bacteria and marine bacteria, right? And so that's how it works. But we also wondered, what are these chemical words that these bacteria are talking with? So we and others started to purify these molecules. So the first molecule, the first autoinducer that was identified was the one from Vibrio fischeri. That's the bacterium we've known about the longest. So in my slides, I use these triangles to portray the molecules. But here in white, this is the actual chemical. It's the word that Vibrio fischeri uses to communicate with its neighbors. So other quorum sensing bacteria got discovered and their words, their chemical words, their autoinducers also got discovered. And so this is just a smattering of a few quorum sensing bacteria and the molecule that each one of these bacteria uses to communicate. And I hope what you can see is that all of the molecules are identical on this left part, but the right part is a little bit different in every single molecule. And these are just carbons. And so these tails, these little carbon tails on these molecules, what those tiny little differences do is they confer exquisite species specificity to each of these molecules. So what I mean by that is if we take the Vibrio fischeri molecule and put it on Pseudomonas, nothing happens. And likewise, Vibrio fischeri is inert to the Pseudomonas molecule. So these molecules allow intra-species communication. These are private, secret languages that bacteria use to count their siblings, right? So they are counting kin and deciding when they and their siblings should do something together. So that's what we initially learned about quorum sensing and how it works. And once we got this far in our discoveries, we started to think, well, this is really great if you're Vibrio fischeri and you live in this nice, pristine light organ of this squid. But most bacteria don't give, get that kind of a rarefied life. Most bacteria live sort of in the Wild West. They live in mixtures with hundreds or thousands of other species of bacteria. And so for, this is shown on this picture. Right here, you're looking at a picture of your skin. This would be your elbow taken under the microscope. And there is a bacterial biofilm on it. You are coated with bacteria. They are like a suit of armor in these biofilms. And on your elbow, this is the biofilm that's there. And what you can see is that all of these different shapes and sizes of bacteria, every one of those is a different species. And so we, what we wondered is if bacteria are really communicating and counting their neighbors with quorum sensing, how do they count when they find themselves in these mixed species communities? And so we wondered, couldn't quorum sensing be more sophisticated than we had thought about in our original studies? And we wanted to explore that question. And so what we decided to do to get at that was to study a cousin of Vibrio fischeri's. We decided to work on a bacterium that's from the ocean that's called Vibrio harvii. So it's related to Vibrio fischeri, except it lives free living in the ocean. So Vibrio harvii is a very common bacterium in the ocean, and we know that it lives in mixtures with all kinds of other bacteria. So we know it lives in mixed species communities.
What's wonderful about Vibrio Harvii is that it is also bioluminescent. And so you're seeing that on this slide. So what you're looking at is this is a flask, some Petri plates, these are some tubes of this Vibrio Harvii. It's at high cell density, it has quorum sensing, and at high cell density, it turns on bioluminescence, right? And so what, you're, what we did to take this picture is we simply turned the lights off in the room. And we took the picture with the light that the bacteria are making. So we're not doing anything to them. They're doing quorum sensing, light turns on, and we could take this picture. And so what was so powerful about this bioluminescence, both in the Vibrio Harvii and the Vibrio Fisheri story, is that we could just see it, right? The bacteria make it. It was a perceivable output of bacteria communicating. So why I think this didn't get discovered for the, you know, almost 500 years that we've known about bacteria is your know, bacteria are invisible. If they're doing something alone or something together, you can't see them. You can't see their behavior. So how would we know that? And so what was so fantastic about bioluminescence is that it made the invisible world of the bacteria visible to us, the scientists. So when the bacteria, these vibrios do quorum sensing, they make light. And so what we could do in the lab is to mutagenize Vibrio harvii. We could make mutants and just turn the lights off in the room and look for bacteria that couldn't make light, figuring if they can't make light, they're not talking to each other. And by doing that simple experiment, that's how we got the components for the Vibrio harvii quorum sensing circuit and then originally for the Vibrio fisheri circuit that I told you about as well. Okay, so this luminescence gave us this way in. So what did we find? So when we started to study this free-living bacterium, Vibrio harvii, what we found was what we suspected is that there was quorum sensing there. So there was an enzyme that made an autoinducer and a partner receptor. And I actually showed you that molecule a couple slides ago. So this autoinducer receptor system was there. But to our surprise, we found that there was a second quorum sensing system. So there was a second enzyme that made a different autoinducer molecule that was secreted out of the cell, and it also had a partner receptor on the membrane to detect it. And so then information from both of these molecules came into the cell to tell Vibrio harvii at high cell density to collectively turn on light and hundreds of other genes. But of course, in our experiment, we're measuring light. And so quorum sensing seemed to have two systems that controlled all of these collective behaviors. And so what we wondered when we made this discovery is what's the point of having these two different quorum sensing systems? And what we figured is if these molecules did not encode different pieces of information, having two systems isn't better than having one. And so we wanted to try to understand the role of the second system. We knew what this one was for. It's for intraspecies communication. So we wanted to explore the new system. So we purified this molecule and what we found, and we figured out the structure of that molecule. And then we looked across all kinds of bacteria. And what we found was that this molecule was universally made. So it, this is the actual structure of that molecule. It's five carbons and it's decorated with all these oxygens. That's interesting to me, but what maybe is interesting to you is that unlike in the first system that I told you about, in this case, when we purified the autoinducer from different species of bacteria, in every case, these bacteria made exactly this molecule. So unlike in the first story where each molecule is a little bit different, in this case, all the bacteria make exactly the same chemical word. So we think then is this is sort of a bacterial Esperanto. This is a universal communication language that allows bacteria to tell there are other non-kin bacteria around. So now what we think is that all quorum sensing bacteria are built the way I've shown here, which is they have one system that says self, and they have another system that says other. And so what we think the computation bacteria do is the following. The first thing they do is they just measure their environment with these receptors for these quorum sensing molecules. And they're asking, you know, am I alone or am I in a group? Alone or in a group? Alone or in a group? And then depending on what they find out from these molecules, they begin to turn on all kinds of genes that underpin group behaviors. 
But then the more sophisticated computation that bac the bacteria do is they actually measure the ratio of the two molecules. And so they're asking, is there more of me or more of my enemy, <laughs> right? And then they tailor what genes they turn on based on whether they and their kin are winning or losing in any given consortium. So they're asking, is it friend or is it foe? And then they turn on offensive genes if they find their family members around, and they turn on defensive genes if they find out that they're around with competitors. Right? So what I'm trying to tell you is that they can tell self from other, and they modulate their behavior based on who's winning and who's losing in these different mixtures using these quorum sensing autoinducers to turn on these collective behaviors. So that's quorum sensing, and I told you in the first story that it is important for virulence. This molecule also controls virulence and biofilm formation in all kinds of pathogenic bacteria. So once we got this far in our studies, we started to wonder if we could take these basic, you know, foundational discoveries where we just learned about bacteria communicating and then try to apply those to make products that could be useful for humanity. And I've already alluded to this. Could we think about controlling pathogenesis by interfering with quorum sensing? So probably you know there is an urgent need for antibiotics um, that bacteria have become resistant to almost our entire arsenal of antibiotics. And so there's a lot of energy in my field to try to find new ways to um, treat or combat harmful bacteria. And what we might want to do is to not kill bacteria like traditional antibiotics do, but rather modulate their behavior so that there would be a softer selection for becoming resistant. And so what we wondered is, could we interfere with quorum sensing? And if bacteria don't know they're in groups, they don't turn on these pathogenesis traits, which require collective behavior. So we wondered if we could make synthetic strategies to interfere with quorum sensing. And so there's sort of two different routes to take, and we've done both of these. The first one is to interfere with the intra-species communication system. So if you um, go to the hospital and your physician knows what is wrong with you, like you have a pseudomonas infection, it'd be really great you know, like with laser precision to be able to just interfere with pseudomonas communication and give you what would be called a narrow spectrum antimicrobial to just shut down the invading infection. So that's one strategy is to interfere with this circuit. On the other hand, sometimes people go to the hospital or they get sick and the physician doesn't know what one has. And so in that case, now what happens is you get treated with a broad spectrum antibiotic that covers all kinds of bacteria. So maybe we could make a similar anti-quorum sensing, broad anti-quorum sensing strategy by trying to interfere with this universal communication molecule and shut down communication in lots of different kinds of bacteria. So the logic is the same. The molecules are different. And so I'll just tell you our newest efforts because I'm very excited about this one right now along these lines. So we have a molecule that we think interferes with this system. Okay, so what we're doing is we're working on a terrible pathogen called Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So Pseudomonas um, is the pathogen that is running around in hospitals when people go to the hospital for, you know, I don't know, to get a gallbladder get their gallbladder removed, or if they come out with an infection, it's a pseudomonas infection. Pseudomonas also infects burn victims, it infects immune compromised people, and it also infects people who have the disease cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis is a disease of the lung. People have a genetic defect that they can't clear their lungs, and so they, they get bacterial infections. And when people with CF are typically in their teens, they become permanently colonized with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and that's what kills people that have cystic fibrosis. So it's problematic in CF, in immune compromised people, burn victims, and it's just a general terrible problem in hospitals. And the reason, one reason is, is because Pseudomonas is really sticky. It loves to form biofilms, which I told you are how bacteria sit on surfaces. So Pseudomonas loves to stick to both both inanimate and inanimate surfaces, right? So it's really sticky, it makes biofilms, and it also has an arsenal of poisons, of toxins, of secreted virulence factors that are the toxins that make people sick. All of these components are controlled by quorum sensing, right? So you get this now, when Pseudomonas is gonna make a biofilm or be virulent. It takes lots of bacteria to make these biofilm communities. It takes lots of bacteria acting together to, to 
um, spew out these virulence factors and overcome the host immune system. So quorum sensing controls that. They only express these traits at high cell density when they perceive these autoinducers and they know, if you will, they're in a group. So what we wondered is if we could make it so Pseudomonas could not detect its autoinducers, could that shut down biofilms and virulence? And so here's the strategy. This is the natural autoinducer. I showed you this a few slides ago. This is the word that Pseudomonas naturally uses for quorum sensing and to understand when it's at high cell density and launch these group behaviors. So we knew the structure of the autoinducer. So what we did with chemistry was we made a synthetic molecule that looks kind of like the autoinducer but acts as an inhibitor. So this is our molecule that we made, and what I hope you can see is that the left side of this molecule looks pretty much like the Pseudomonas autoinducer, but what we've done is we've attached this big group, sort of like a bump, to the right-hand side of the molecule. And what you'll remember that I told you is that these autoinducers fit like locks and keys into those receptors that, that detect them. And so this molecule fits into the Pseudomonas receptor and turns on quorum sensing. Our molecule, when it slots into the receptor, because it kind of looks like an autoinducer, because there's this big bump on the end, it just sits inside the receptor, it doesn't turn on quorum sensing, and it blocks the receptor from detecting the real autoinducer. So it's an inhibitor that jams the receptor and shuts down pseudomonas quorum sensing, pseudomonas chemical communication. Okay, so that's how the, the strategy, the logic behind the strategy, so does it work? All right, so here's the experiment that shows that it could work. So we have an animal infection model for Pseudomonas, right? So what you're looking at here, this is how many animals are alive over time. And so of course, if we don't infect the animals with Pseudomonas, all the animals are alive a day later. If we give the, the animal a pseudomonas infection, it's lethal. And so what you can see is that a roughly a day later, nearly all the animals are dead. But now if we give the pseudomonas infection, but we also give that inhibitor, that anti-quorum sensing molecule, what you can see is that the animals don't die. So that shows you we can shut down quorum sensing and stop the infection. And so I want to be really clear, this is not a medicine yet. This is a lead molecule. We, it's not very potent. We have to give a lot. It's not particularly safe, like if you gave it to a human. You know, this is a proof of principle experiment that gave us confidence that there's merit to this new idea for how we might treat infections, which is by shutting down bacterial communication. Right, And so now what we have to do is the medicinal chemistry to make this molecule safe. We need it to go where we want it to go. If we were to give it, we need it to last the right amount of time. But we didn't want to you know, try that until we knew that perhaps it could work. And so anyway, we were pretty excited about this experiment and thinking that there could be a new way to treat bacterial infections by interfering with cell-cell communication. So I want to finish up and just give a summary. Um, and hopefully you'll have questions for me. So what I hope you've learned in this seminar is that bacteria can talk to each other. So their words are chemical, but they communicate, they are ancient. And so we think that social behaviors have been on this earth for billions of years. They are multicellular. What quorum sensing lets bacteria do is to actually synchronize the behavior of the group Right, and of course, that's what higher organisms, both cells and organisms do, right, is that they synchronize behavior. And again, we think this is a very ancient trait that exists in the world's most primitive organisms. And hopefully by studying it in bacteria, we can learn about multicellular behavior or multi-organism behavior in higher organisms. And we can help our colleagues that study those kinds of traits in higher organisms. I've also showed you that using these two molecules, bacteria can distinguish self from other. Again, that's what the cells in your body do. It's not like your heart cells and your kidney cells get all mixed up with each other. They each have their own kinds of chemicals that tell them what to do, what their jobs are, right? And again, we think that that originally evolved in a simpler way in bacteria and that the principles that we're discovering have probably transcended evolution and can be useful for understanding just um, uh, un for understanding distinguishing self from other in higher organisms. And now there's an, apl an applied part to this, to this um, research, which is to develop strategies to impede quorum sensing in harmful bacteria. But to go back to my 
first slides, remember we're also now learning that most bacteria that we encounter are beneficial, right? They live with us and every higher organism, organism in these um, magical communities that keep us alive and absolutely make us healthy. And so maybe we could make pro-quorum sensing molecules. We know the microbiome bacteria are chit-chatting away. And so perhaps the way forward in medicine is instead of trying to fight against the back the bad bacteria, we can improve quorum sensing communication in beneficial bacteria. You know, we know those guys are working as our partners to keep harmful bacteria out. Maybe we can actually make them better at that. So we have a pony in both of these races. We're trying to um, make anti-quorum sensing uh, molecules for harmful bacteria, pro-quorum sensing molecules for beneficial bacteria, and we're going to see how that plays out in the future. And then let me finish by saying, by making a confession, which is that we didn't think any of this up, the bacteria did. Once, you know, me and my gang and our field got onto all this, we thought, now, wait a minute, these bacteria have billion year head start and they've been duking it out in nature for all these billions of years. Maybe they've already invented these strategies. And so sure enough, one can go out there in nature and find these naturally occurring pro and anti quorum sensing strategies. So bacteria eat each other's autoinducers, they make enzymes that clip them in half, they make um, you know, inhibitors, they make molecules that trick each other, so they free ride, they cheat, they eavesdrop. And so now one of the ways the field is moving is to go out there and actually mine these um, strategies that are naturally occurring and bring those into the lab and use those as the building blocks to make them better for medicine or industry, thinking that the ones the bacteria have made up have been tried over billions of years of evolution. So those are probably a lot better and more potent strategies than we can just think up in the labs by ourselves. So we're using nature and bacteria as our inspiration to make the next generation of these natural pro and anti quorum sensing uh, hopefully applications. Okay, and with that, let me finish. This is my gang. So um, this is uh, my lab and our families at, I don't know, some obviously pre-COVID at a party at my house. And I just wanna make sure that I uh, give credit that somebody somebody's intellect and brain and hands and grit did in this picture did all of the experiments that i told you about you know it's absolutely thrilling to get to work with this uh with young up-and-coming scientists right they don't believe anything they've been told they believe they can make the world better they believe that they can make discoveries to change how we think about nature and so if ever you're reading you know scientific american or tuesday new york times or you learn you hear something fantastic about science on the radio or on TV, the likelihood that somebody uh, in his or her 20s or 30s did that is high because this is the engine that fuels science in this country. And let me tell you, it is a rush and exhausting to work with these, these uh, uh, amazing creatures, but they did made all of these discoveries and they have profoundly changed the way the world thinks about micros and uh, microbes, and I'm really lucky and privileged to get to work with them. And that's it, and I'm lucky and privileged to get to give this talk, and hopefully you guys have some questions for me, um, and I'd love to take them. And so again, I give you my heartfelt thanks for having me. It, it's a, a treat and an honor to, to be here. What an amazing talk, Dr. Bassler. I'm just blown away. I, it's what I love about the Bartlett Lecture. It's just always it's fascinating to hear about the amazing science going on. Oh, thanks. It's, uh, it's, every day is fun here, so thanks. Yeah, they're great. Let me start with this question. H have you seen examples of bacteria adapting or evolving to match your attempts to impede quorum sensing? Yeah. Right. So we are okay. So we don't have to learn that lesson again. Right. So exactly. So um, we know we haven't had enough time. Right. These aren't these aren't actually given as therapeutics yet, but we do that in the lab. We look for resistance on purpose. And so what I can say is that they will get resistant. Right. We you know that we've learned from traditional antibiotics. What we're the what we hope Right, so a traditional antibiotic kills bacteria or stops their growth. So you automatically select, if you will, for bacteria that can grow, resistant mutants, right? Because you've killed everybody else. What we hope with like a behavior modification strategy is that the selection for resistance is softer. Right here, all you're doing is shutting down quorum sensing. You're not killing the, the other bacteria off. And so, so the, the fantasy and the whole field is moving this way, you know, like if we could 
um, modulate behavior, all kinds of behaviors, is that you will get resistance, but it will take longer because you don't automatically select by killing off most of the bacteria with the drug. So it's going to happen, and then hopefully one of the people in my picture can think up the next behavior to <laughs> modify. It's going to happen, and now what we're really trying to do is to just look for the mechanisms. Like, we actually try to get resistant mutants in the lab because maybe we could be a step ahead. Like, if we knew how they were going to get resistant, like, what is the molecular mechanism, then maybe we could be thinking about that before these are even given as therapies. And so that's the goal. Yeah. All right. Do organisms other than bacteria talk to each other with quorum sensing? Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm totally brainwashed. I think quorum sensing controls everything on Earth. And so absolutely, we have seen so far, we so far, right, is that for sure your gut cells make autoinducers that communicate to the bacteria living in your gut. So that's an interkingdom you know, com com cross communication. So we've seen that, that, that this is not a monologue, it's a dialogue in your gut. We have also found viruses that eavesdrop on bacterial quorum sensing and they use that information to know when they should infect, you know, because there's lots of cells around, that's a good time for a virus to infect, right? So, so far we have seen mimics of bacterial autoinducers and we've seen eavesdropping across domains you know viruses bacteria and higher organisms what hasn't been discovered yet right is like real quorum sensing like in a eukaryote not yet you know like where you your cells are talking to your cells but i'm optimistic that that will happen now that we know this that's fantasy. It hasn't been found yet, but um, people are actually looking in yeast. So yeast are a higher organism, but they're a microbe, you know, so they're sort of a simpler version of us. And so I think that's a good way to sort of bootstrap your way up to, you know, say humans. But not yet. But, but for sure, cross-domain quorum sensing happens. So far, bacteria are somehow still involved in it. All right, a question from Regina. Uh, have cyanobacteria in freshwater environments been found to communicate this way to make certain bloom populations toxic while other blooms are non-toxic all right right okay so the answer is people think cyanobacteria right they're a very ancient bacteria um could have quorum sensing there's some hints right it has not been shown in those blooms to my knowledge but again like your regina and all these questions everybody's on the right track you think of these group behaviors you know and i think you know yum yum that's got to be quorum sensing that doesn't mean it's been discovered but i think that's a tantalizing behavior right that you know you know you need lots of cells together to make to make those happen um all of those kinds of behaviors where microbes give something away to the world you know, they never get their own product back. And so those always smack of quorum sensing to me. But the real answer to that question is, to my knowledge, that hasn't been discovered as the culprit yet in those blooms. All right, uh, the next question. Uh, curious, uh, someone writes, curious about infections where the causative bacteria are dormant. Is there suspicion among scientists that quorum sensing, quorum sensing is involved in these bacteria coming out of dormancy? Has there been any specific work on this aspect? Yeah, so we think we, in lots of these cases, so this, you know, so remember there's tons of different kinds of diseases. Dormant, we think, means that bacteria are sort of sitting in these little pockets of biofilms, right? Like I told you, these films. So the biofilm you know is the one on your teeth, right? Every morning you get up, you, you've got that gudge on your teeth, you brush it off, it's back the next morning. That's a bacterial biofilm. There are 600 different species on your teeth every morning. So you have biofilms in your gut, you know, you're supposed to. And what we think is that when bacteria are dormant, and I'll call like chronic, but you don't quite get rid of all of them is because they're in biofilm like on a knee implant or a hip or you know in a hard valve you know and they're sort of covered in this goop right and so the antibiotics can't penetrate and they're just kind of sitting there and we know quorum sensing controls biofilm assembly and disassembly so the idea that when they go from from being in a biofilm to being an active infection, there are hints that quorum sensing's got to be involved in that because quorum sensing controls biofilm formation and the escape from biofilms. We gotta have a COVID-19 question and here it is. 
could we manipulate the bacteria in the microbiome to use quorum sensing to create a protein that searches for the spiky, yeah. spiky protein structure present in COVID-19 to then signal to other bacterial cells to fight this foreign substance? So, okay, so we, so I don't know if we can make that work for COVID, but you can just, I think that's a great question, and you can just insert, you know, bad thing X there, and so we can use COVID tonight. The idea that absolutely, so this whole field of sort of synthetic biology loves using quorum sensing circuits that you can get bacteria to do tricks, if you will, on demand, right? Like you either get them to make something good, you get them to kill something, you get them to not do something bad. So the scientists are all over that idea that you can make, use quorum sensing. You know, we know the molecules, we know the circuits, right? I mean, these are really hard, you know, to get to really work at scale. But on a miniature scale, that idea that we use these bacteria, I mean, right, to, um, carry out tasks exactly when and where we want them by squirting in an autoinducer or you know, a synthetic molecule, that is all the rage. And it's a matter of time before we, you know, COVID is now, right? So that I don't think is gonna be the answer this year to COVID, right? But that idea in the long run to do this for all kinds of both medical and industrial processes, both bad and good, that the scientists together with the engineers and the biologists, the engineers, the chemists together are really all over that idea that these quorum sensing circuits give us real handles for making fantastic applications. Yeah. Well, then how far away are we? Five years, yeah. 10 years? Okay. So, um, so I think, so I don't want to, COVID, I don't, you know, COVID, right. you know, yeah, but but so I think so for medicines, those are really starting to work. They're in, you know, sort of animal, tri you saw ours, right? So I think we're, you know, but of course these things have to be safe and effective and academics don't make them into medicines, you know, at scale that go into humans. But I think that's five or 10 years way before there's real merit behind that. The applications like for industry, like if you don't have to, you know, put it in your mouth and I don't have to worry about killing you, you know, with my medicine, those are gonna be soon, right? Those are, scientists are engineering these synthetic bacterial um, things and they're already using them industry and bioremediation right things like that where they're not medical those are faster right be and they should be because you because there's not the health concern of a patient right but they but they already use bacteria to bioremediate things quorum sensing is involved in that I think those things are happening fast right clean your contact lenses do all kinds of stuff right <laughs> Yeah. All right, uh, next question. How does horizontal gene transfer affect quorum sensing? Ah, I will turn that around. How does quorum sensing affect horizontal gene transfer? Okay, so because quorum sensing controls that. Um, anyway, well, let so me let ask, me make sure. Yeah, well, let me interrupt. I'll tell you what um, I guess what is horizontal gene transfer? Yeah, I'm going to tell you. So, <laughs> horizontal gene transfer is bacterial sex. So, uh, uh, bacteria swap genes around, you know, that's how they get resistance, that's how they get new traits, right? And so what they can do is, is they can eat different bacteria will actually mate, right? And give each other pieces of DNA. So that's gene transfer horizontally from one bacterium to another. So if you think about it, right? To do that, right? Bacteria is small, the world is big. If you wanna find a mating partner, right? they're not monogamous let's call it that way so anyway quorum sensing in many cases controls horizontal gene transfer so the idea is you got to have lots of bacteria around so a recipient you know if i'm going to squirt my dna out you want a recipient to get it and so typically horizontal gene transfer only happens at high cell density and the bacteria detect the autoinducers it's just one of these traits right and then it's kind of an orgy they all start swapping genes when there's lots of cells around because then you know not so being serious about it the chances that my gene get into some other cell are much higher at high cell density so there's there's lots of cases where that's controlled by quorum sensing so they're intimately connected were there side effects of the inhibitor right that you okay mentioned? so yeah exactly so we, again i want to make sure i'm really clear we have to make this molecule safe and look like a medicine and it doesn't and so so far in the animal experiment very crude tests it it affects the bacteria 
right? It stops them from chit-chatting. And then what it does is it simply gives your the animal, the immune system time to clear the infection, right? So all we think we're doing is just letting what, what happens all the time, like most of the time you eat or you get bacteria and your immune system clears them away. It's only when these bacteria have these terrible bells and whistles that they overcome your immune system. So all we're doing is tipping the scales by stopping the bacteria from carrying out these group behaviors and giving your immune, the animal's immune system time to mop them up. And so, so far in really crude ways, it's not like the animal was sick. It's not like the, the molecule mattered, but again, that has been done in sort of little academic sense here. It's not done well. But Are, the molecules, you know, we can feed the molecule to the animals and they don't show any bad signs. And there's a number of tests that you do for that. All right, we're at the top of the hour. Let's do a couple more questions. Uh, Irene has a question. When you used a modified genetic insertion, you mentioned the long tail was modified, but there was also a sulfa substitute for a carbon in the proximal ring. Does this yeah. also influence the effect of this inhibitor? Yeah. All right. This is supposed to be a layperson talk. Okay, right. So this is in the inhibitor, right? <laughs> if you remember, <laughs> I can't believe anybody noticed that. Anyway, so if you remember oh, everybody, my inhibitor. Everybody noticed that. I, yeah, of course, right, yeah, okay. <laughs> My inhibitor, if you notice, so there's a ring, a tail, and then the thing that I'm calling the big bump. And so in the real molecule, there's an, in the middle of that ring, there's an oxygen. That was the left molecule. In my molecule with the big bump, in the middle of that ring, there was an S, a sulfur, right? As, what was the person? I didn't get the person's name who asked that. Um, anyway, that in human cells or eukaryotic cells, we have an enzyme that will clip the ring if there's an oxygen in it. So we put a sulfur in because then when we give the inhibitor, your own enzymes don't degrade it, right? So that was a trick we knew, right? That, that, the, that, the, that what would have happened, it never would have gotten to the bacteria because it would have just gotten digested in the eukarya, in the animal, right? So the sulfur for oxygen switch was a known trick, right? But, and sulfur and oxygen almost look like each other, those atoms. So the shape of the molecule stayed the same, but it made the, gave the molecule longer half-life in the animal. All right, let's make this our last question for the evening. Uh, it's from Brian, and he asked, you mentioned about helping the beneficial bacteria in the gut, but what about the potential to increase human performance beyond our current abilities through these processes? Yeah. So, okay, again, go, Brian, going back to me thinking that that corn that if you could make if you could really manipulate like, and I mean safely and robustly and without unintended consequences, and we're not there yet. If you could make these micro these consortia, you know, these these microbiome bacteria work harder and better and more efficiently for our health. You know, I don't know what performance you're talking about, but just general health could be better. And then, you know, we don't know all of the amazing traits these micro, these, these uh, microbiome bacteria give us. But as we learn them, you can imagine being able to make, make us healthier or better in um, different ways, for sure. Right, what, you know, we have to learn, you know, we know they digest our food, we know they educate our immune system, we know they, you know, can attack certain harmful cells, you know, you know so I think all of that makes just general performance better if you were healthier, right? But you can imagine very slick strategies where you could pinpoint particular, eventually microbiome bacteria that help in particular features of human health and you could make those better. It's going to be fascinating to follow your research in the coming years. It's an exciting field. Yeah, we're not done, and I need a job, so <laughs> that, that's good. Yeah, yeah it's well, very exciting. And I, and I just say one more time, I'm so delighted to get to give this talk in the mix, midst of COVID and working hard to keep everybody safe. Um, it's really generous of you to let me do this in this format. I'm, I'm, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for taking the time to share your research and your expertise. I know I learned a great deal. I'm sure everyone uh, did as well. Uh, we're going to have to do this again and bring you to Kansas City, and uh, you have a chance to look at more of our 
wonderful yeah. rare book collection in the history of science. Uh, I'm yours. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll take you up on that. And okay. thank you, everyone, for attending tonight's Paul D. Bartlett Senior Lecture. For more information about all of our upcoming programs and resources at the Linda Hall Library, visit lindahall.org. And thank you again, and a special thank you to the Princeton Alumni Association of Greater Kansas City.